deliverance. It seems to be a never-ending hot topic and one that causes contention and debate among people. While some teach, while some teach and practice mass deliverance. Hallelujah. Repeat this prayer after me. You're going to say it and mean it with all of your heart. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I'm here tonight. I'm here tonight. Because I need deliverance. Father. Father I'm, asking you, I'm asking you. I'm giving you. I'm giving you authority. To turn on the lights. Holy Spirit. Go into every room. Inside of me now. And turn on the lights. Find the snakes. Find the snakes. Wherever they're hiding. Inside of me. In the name of Jesus. I command. Every demon. Every viper. Every snake. Inside of me. Wherever you're at. I command you. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus name. Leave me now. In Jesus name. God is revealing areas of our life that don't line up with his word. And you don't need to walk out with your head down all condemned. You're going to walk out with your head up saying, I have the spirit of God. And the same way God sent Jesus to the earth, Jesus said, I now send you. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for deliverance this morning. I'm ready to get free. I want every critter out of me. I want every demon out of me. I'm tired of letting these demonic spirits hold me back because it is not the Holy Spirit that's holding you back this morning. It is not the Holy Spirit that's making you not pray. It is not the Holy Spirit. That thought right now where you're like, this isn't for me. That's not the Holy Spirit. It's a demonic spirit. And the devil is right outside this building according to scripture. And here's what he's doing. He's prowling around the streets in the parking lot. And here's what he's waiting for. Who will still belong to me after the service? He's right outside roaming the parking lot saying, I wonder who's still going to be mine after the service. And I say that there will not be one person in Jesus name that still belongs because we are having a bank wire transfer and you are being transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light in Jesus name, that you will be delivered in Jesus name, that you will be saved in Jesus name. If God be God, then serve God. But if Baal is God, then serve Baal. But how long will you halter between two opinions? It is time to say, Lord, deliver me. Lord, set me free. Satan, you are bound in Jesus' name. I bind every demonic spirit. I bind every demonic power. Satan, it's time for you to come up and out in Jesus' name. Spirit of addiction, we bind you in Jesus' name. Spirit of anger, we know you're there. We bind you in Jesus' name. Some do Zoom deliverance and teach self-deliverance. Your life. Okay, hear me when I say this, for real. Some of you have been dealing with demons in your life that have been there for years. Years, I mean, things happened even in your childhood. You've been bound up, bound up in your mind, bound up in your body, bound up in your emotions. Your prayer life is a mess. It seems like you can't really enter into worship. There's just a lot going on and you know you know that there's something there. You know that that's something that's tormenting you, that is oppressing you, okay? That doesn't mean that you completely belong to the devil because you've given your heart to God. So we know that your spirit belongs to the Lord, but the enemy can get in other ways. That's why the Bible says, don't give him a foothold. That means he's in there somehow. That foothold is him. He's got his foot in there. That means there's a portion, a part of your, your soul realm even your body that the enemy can occupy. He can't have your spirit. Your spirit belongs to the Lord. You are bl blood bought. You've been bought with a price. Okay. So, hold on a minute. I promise to God you are not going to do this on this live. Okay. So, let me go ahead and get every confused devil on out. Let me get every confused devil on out. All right. So you know that you're bound up. You know that things have been going on. You may need to actually go to a deliverance minister. Say this. Say this after me. Father, these demons have been in me long enough. And I ask you now that you would declare all out war against these demons. Father, in the name of Jesus, move in full force against these demons 
so that I can be fully free once and for all in the mighty name of Jesus. Say it out loud, come on. In the name of Jesus, I now plead the blood of Jesus over every inch of my body, over every inch of my soul, over every inch of my spirit, so that I can have a full protective covering against these demons. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I say that I will be fully protected during this entire deliverance. Now, it's not the pattern of scripture to do deliverance on yourself. This is not the pattern Jesus teaches. Is it possible? Yes. But the true pattern of scripture is doing deliverance on other people. So it's always going to be, if you're taking notes, easier to ca get someone else to cast a demon out of you than to cast a demon out of yourself. Now, of course, I want to say this. All things are possible with God. And of course, God can deliver you anytime. The area of contention comes not in the word deliverance itself, but in the doctrine of Christians having indwelling demons that need to be cast out. If you cast out demons, you've had people come and tell you, Christians can't have demons, deliverance isn't for today, constantly dealing with other Christians, arguing and debating whether we should be doing what Jesus said to do. Jesus started deliverance, it was his ministry, the disciples continued it, it is for today. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says a Christian can't have a demon. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says deliverance ended. So I want to, rather than train you to argue back or, you know, train you to give a reason for, which we've done in tons of other videos, I want to give you counter arguments for those that believe Christians can't have demons or deliverance isn't for today. Maybe you are one of those people that don't believe Christians could have demons, or maybe you are one of those people that don't believe deliverance is for today. These 25 counter arguments are directed right at you. These are not easy to answer by using scripture. I think a lot of times we have these arguments, well, a Christian can't have a demon because how could the demon live where the Holy Spirit is? And we make up these arguments that are not in the Bible. There's nowhere in the entire Bible that says a Christian can't have a demon. So let's give you guys these 25 counter arguments. I hope this gives you a little bit of ammo for those that are always attacking you, coming at you, trying to give you arguments. A lot of you don't know what to say back to them. Give them some of these counter arguments and see if they can answer some of these questions. Let's jump into this. And this is what will be the topic of discussion today. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. Several weeks ago, I came across a post on YouTube titled 25 counter arguments to those who say Christians can't have demons and deliverance is not for today. And as I was reading through the list of questions, I decided to tackle them and to provide some thoughts for consideration, as well as directing back to scripture for understanding. And perhaps your first argument to me might be, well, why do you have any right to say anything? Have you ever cast a demon out of anyone? That's you, usually when you're in this movement, that's one of the things you'll ask people is kind of a gotcha. Well, when was the last time you cast out a demon? Well, I actually was a part of a ministry that uh, focused on prophetic deliverance, apostolic, hyper charismatic for almost 20 years. For those who are listening, you probably already heard some of this. But I have some experience, for lack of better words, I have some experience with this. And I also traveled overseas to on some of these trips, and there were th things that happened that people said that demons came out. Now, the question is, is that true? And was the gospel preached? Was the true gospel preached when that happened? And can we go back and track these people down to see what their lives look like now to see if this was the case, because that's anecdotal. What If I were to share with you the experience that I had, that's anecdotal. And quite frankly, that doesn't carry a whole lot of weight in comparison to what Scripture says. And the fruit of a true believer in Christ demonstrates that agrees with Scripture. That's what we should be looking at. And so we should be basing our belief and our argument on the foundation of the truth of the Word of God, not on anecdotal experience, secondhand experience, even firsthand experience, because anybody that's not a Christian can argue from experience. And experiences can be very real, but we have to take things back to Scripture. So I wanted to tackle these today. 
The first thing I want to consider when looking at this today, Isaiah Saldivar was the one that that brought these out, and he even has a video that's a little bit older than the original texted post that he put out of these 25 questions. But the first thing I want you to consider, the assertion is made that Christians can have indwelling demons. It'll be said the deliverance is the children's bread and deliverance is only done on believers, which I've heard Isaiah say this before in some of his videos. He only does deliverance on believers. And so we must understand this up front because the foundation to all these questions, the underlying foundation is Christians can have indwelling demons. You and I both must keep that at the forefront of this this uh, evaluation. And much of this comes from books written expressing this belief and from anecdotal experience. Again, if you're familiar with the series I've been doing, and it's taken me a while to do it because of just life in general happening, but I have one final set to do for Pigs in the Parlor. I have been evaluating that book. That is a very well-known book in these in these movements. And um, I, I heard of this book while I was in this movement as well, but it's written by Frank Hammond, Frank and Ida Mae Hammond, and they were very well known for doing, for doing deliverance ministry. Now, they're not the only ones. There are several ministers through the years that have uh, been known for doing this and perpetuating these teachings. But if you've read Pigs in the Parlor or you've been on videos and, and when I've been covering this, then you'll understand there's some very concerning things in there. So a lot of this comes from their teachings, from their, again, you heard Isaiah say at the beginning of his intro, it's not coming from scripture because you they can't find scripture to say that, script, that Christians can't have demons. The argument could equally be made, you cannot find scriptures that Christians can have demons. And that should be comforting to us. That should give us hope as true believers in Christ. Rather than trying to find scripture that tells us we can have demons, seems to diminish the work of Christ on the cross, and it seems to diminish the power of the Holy Spirit, to be quite frank with you. And I'm going to be quite frank today because some of this is, it's rather concerning and frustrating at times. Now, as someone looking at this and looking in, in out from the outside looking in, because I would argue this brings more bondage to people. It's not setting people free. If anything, it's it's causing a it's causing a, a dependency on man or woman, if you will, to deliver you and while using God's name in the process. So this teaching also you'll notice that many people that hold to this teaching have a trichotomy-based teaching or a trichotomy-based belief system, meaning that they believe that man or woman is made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit, and that the Holy Spirit indwells the spirit of the believer, but that demons can also simultaneously dwell within, whether in the soul or the flesh, which seems kind of interesting to me when you think about it, that they'll say, well, the Holy Spirit is a spirit and he dwells in your spirit. But demons are spirits, but they can't dwell in your spirit. But then they choose to compartmentalize. And the Holy Spirit is a weakling, if you will. I know that some people will get mad at me saying that because they'll say, well, you're making a wrong presumption there. We don't think the Holy Spirit's a weakling. But if the Holy Spirit is is strong enough to save us, then he's, he's strong enough to deliver us. And we don't need to worry about demons living within us and, and also avoiding the, the S word, which apparently seems to be a bad word these days. It's called sin that we're contending with, that we know we have three adversaries, the world, the flesh, and the devil that we're contending with in this world. But we have victory through Christ. We're not left ill-equipped and we're not left unattended. We're not left with without defenses and we're not left without hope. And so I want to encourage you in this podcast today, along with maybe giving you some food for thought on these questions. This is not to attack Isaiah. This is rather to take a, a look at this and to evaluate it and to see, okay, well, what does scripture have to say? Well, what questions could be asked to... Um, counter <laughs> this counter argument. That's something to consider there. And in, in case you're wondering where that belief comes from, that's what it is. The, these, the people that hold to this many times will believe that there's a trichotomy base to um, human beings, whereas scripture um, seems to point to a dichotomy of man being or woman, man and woman being flesh and soul and spirit usually is c combined together into two. 
there's even some debates on people that believe trichotomy versus dichotomy of, of man and woman. There's also the teaching of generational curses. People teach that there's demons that attach themselves to bloodlines. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that comes out of this, and we won't get on to, into that today because it's going to be an in-depth podcast into these 25 counter arguments. So with that, let's take a look at some of these questions. Now, the first question that Isaiah posed was, if deliverance is not necessary any longer, where did all the demons go? They were there when Jesus was around. Did they leave when the apostles died? My retort to this would be, uh, where were all the demons before Jesus came to do his earthly ministry? Why do we not see a heavy emphasis on them in the Old Testament? We see barely any mention of demons. We see sacrifice to demons that could go on. We see this in the Old Testament that that's mentioned. We see in 1 Samuel 16, 14, where the, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and that a spirit from the Lord sent to harass or torment him came on Saul. Isn't that interesting? I mean, you see there that some people will use Saul as an example of, well, see, there was a demon that came into him because he was a believer, but we don't know that he was truly a believer or not. And we also notice that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, which we do see a difference in the Old Testament and New Testament of how the Holy Spirit operated in those who believed. So that's a whole other topic for another day. But I, this is something to consider with this question. If deliverance isn't necessary any longer, mind you, deliverance for Christians, <laughs> then where did all the demons go? Where were they before the earthly ministry of Jesus? Now, this is not to say that the Jewish culture did not acknowledge the existence of demons. It seems rather interesting that we see an increase in demonic activity being evident upon Jesus's earthly ministry. I listened to something recently. I'm going to sh share the link below, but Sinclair Ferguson, I found this, that he was talking about it. And, and I hadn't really thought about it before, but he talks about how when Jesus's earthly ministry began, it seemed that there was an uptick or an upsurge of the demonic being evident. And that's something to take note of because we don't see that in the Old Testament. It wasn't until Jesus's earthly ministry and his incarnation that we see demonic activity ramped up. And it's to show that Jesus had power over these demons and he had authority over them as the son of God. And mind you, these demons also acknowledged him in different passages of scripture as the son of God. They acknowledged him not only as Jesus of Nazareth, they acknowledged him as the son of God. And they were afraid that they were going to be cast into the abyss. We see all these different things in scripture that point to Jesus being who he was. He was the son of God, truly God and truly man. And he came to bring the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Repent and believe that you may have salvation and may have eternal life in him. The gospel of the kingdom, that there was good news that was being brought to the bad news from sin and death that was ruling and reigning because of what Adam did. You see, there's good news in all of this. So, dear Christian, if you, for those that are truly in Christ and you've been hearing these sentiments and these teachings that you have indwelling demons that constantly need to be cast out, I hope that you'll get some comfort in this today. And I also hope that you'll evaluate yourself, first of all, to make sure that you're even in the faith, according to 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to make sure that you have a proper understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that is your answer, my friend. That is your answer to every thing, every trial, every hardship, it is Christ and him crucified for your salvation. And then he helps to save you from the power of sin in your life. And the Holy Spirit helps you do that. He helps you do that. You're not left ill-equipped and you're not alone. And the Holy Spirit is not a weakling, by the way. And the Holy Spirit does not cohabit with demons in, the, in a believer, in the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm getting ahead of myself. So I wanted to mention that, though, and I also wanted to mention in Mark chapter 1, verse 27, for example, we see early on in this gospel that when Jesus is casting a demon out of a man in a synagogue, which does not mean he was a believer, by the way, in Mark chapter 1, verse 27, we see that the people were amazed when this happened because Jesus rebuked him and he said, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. The people were amazed in verse 27, so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And the reason being is because in the Jewish culture at that time, if you do a little bit of digging and studying, you'll find that their belief system 
was very different. There were rabbis that were actually doing exorcisms during that time, but it was very different than what Jesus was doing because he was speaking from a place of authority. Whereas many of these people were using such things as magical uh, f formulas that they spoke over people and having so many people involved in the, in the ritual that they believe that's what got demons out of people. And so this was not uncommon for them to see some sort of demon being c cast out of people. But the thing was, is that Jesus was speaking with authority and it was immediate and quick. And he had authority to do this. And it amazed the people. 13 times in the in the New Testament, in the gospel specifically, we the reference to uh, daimonazomai, which is that Greek word that stands for possessed or be to be demonized in the gospels. We see Matthew 4, 24, that they brought the demoniacs to Jesus and he healed them. It says nowhere in that passage, by the way, that these people were believers. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says the same thing, same wording, that there were many people brought to Jesus and that he healed them of diseases and that he healed them free of these demons. Uh, we see in Matthew chapter 9, verse 32, that, and, and as well as Matthew 12, 22, that there, were, uh, there was a man brought to Jesus. One was mute in Matthew 9. The other one was a mute and blind in Matthew 22. The demon was uh, said to be cast out in Matthew 9, but it was not cast out in Matthew 12, according to the wording. He was just healed. Now, once you notice something here, these men did not profess to believe because they were mute. How do we know they were believers? And then we see the new doctrine of teaching in Mark chapter 1, verse 32. We see that Christ's power over demons is absolute, that, that demons, like I said, recognized him as the Holy One of God. We see that in Luke 4, 34 and Luke 4, 41. That's probably enough to consider for question number one. Let's move on to question number two. Question number two said, you believe we should obey what Jesus told the disciples to, except for when it comes to casting out demons. What else should we not obey that Jesus clearly said to do? Well, did Jesus tell the disciples to cast demons out of believers? Again, you have to go back to this understanding of the premise here, that there's a belief that Christians can have indwelling demons. Number three, Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 28 to teach them to obey everything I commanded of you. Did he mean everything by casting out demons? Well, since he brought up Matthew 28, let's take a look at Matthew 28 right there. So Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, this is a very well-known passage. It's the great commission that Jesus sends his disciples to do. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Actually, it's back up to verse 16. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had redirected them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This was the instruction that Jesus gave his disciples. They were to go and make disciples, to go and make disciples, to preach the gospel, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My question would be, and this is going to be a sensitive one, Isaiah, he partners with people like Marcus Rogers. Marcus Rogers does not believe in baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So does he take issue with that? Does he believe that, that uh, Marcus is disobeying? The Great Commission, the belief of the Trinity, that's just something to consider. Matthew 7, let's take a look at Matthew 7 real quick. So we know that, for example, in this gospel, uh, in Matthew 7, 5, 6, and 7, we see the Beatitudes. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, mighty works are not proof of God's approval or of a true believer in Christ. It's not at all. And you can prophesy and you can cast out demons, but that doesn't mean that you know Christ. The fruit of our, a true believer, of a penitent believer in Christ, of a transformed life in Christ that has been redeemed by the, the Savior and is filled with the Holy Spirit at the moment of regeneration. That is what marks us as a believer in Christ. It is not the, the signs and wonders that mark us, but is, is what's Christ, it's Christ's work that marks us as a true believer. And I would point you to Acts 19, 13 through 16. We see seven sons of Sceva that obviously we know that they weren't believers. They were operating in the name of trying to operate in the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean anything um, as far as their fruit. I would encourage you to read Matthew 5 through 7. 
in uh, Matthew 10, 12, it's talking about the apostles, particularly in verse 5. The 12 that Jesus sent out, he instructed them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. This was to the lost sheep of Israel. And the, and the question that Isaiah is asking, Jesus told the disciples to obey to everything he commanded to him. Well, did Jesus command or teach how to pray in tongues? That's one thing I would like to ask. Or rather, did he teach the Lord's prayer to his disciples, which people will degrade uh, praying the Lord's will that will be done. And they'll say there's no power in that. Well, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray that. So why are we disobeying that? See, there's a lot of things that we can we can start poking holes in some of these questions. And I'm sure people could try to start poking holes in my questions too. Ultimately, though, it goes back to Scripture and what Scripture has to say. And if your experience is your the foundation you're resting upon, it's not good. It's not a good foundation. If your script if your experience is contradicting or it's adding to Scripture, then basically then you're gonna have some issues there. And the foundation of your faith is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number four, where does the Bible say demons leave when someone gets saved? My question would be, where does it say every single person has an indwelling demon? Because that's making an assumption that every single human being has an indwelling demon. And scripture does not say that. Actually, what scripture does say, as I said before, we have three enemies. The scripture tells us that the world, the flesh, and the devil are our enemies or are things that we contend with while we're in this world. And Romans 5 also makes it clear that every single one of us have this issue that we're dealing with. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. I would also remind you, dear friend, that scripture tells us in 1 John 4, 4, for those who are in Christ, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That does not say greater are you because he's in you. It says greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, meaning that demons are not in believers. Number five, if Christians can have demons, how can they have a sickness, which the Bible makes clear can come from a demon? Well, not all sickness comes from a demon. I think that we could easily agree on that. If we, if we read through the Bible, we can see that not all sickness comes from demons. And actually, people take it a step further. Um, and if we want to obviously take into the account of the sovereignty of God, if you want to read the Old Testament and even read in the New Testament, you'll begin to see that God put sickness on people and it served a purpose. I know that's not a popular teaching, and I know that's not what I was taught when I was in this, and for a long time, I would rebuke Satan, and I would bind up sickness and watch the power of my words and do all this. So again, not that I need to have that experience to validate my questioning, but in case someone wants to know how, why I have the ability to question that, and if I've never understood that, actually I did for, a number of, for almost two decades. I understood that line of thinking. And it's not biblical. Scripture tells us over and over again, we are promised suffering. We are never promised an easy road, but we have faith in Christ. We cling to Christ. He holds us. We can, we can be secure in our salvation in that and that we trust him and that we are continuing to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit and being led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And we understand that there will be sickness that comes because guess what? We live in a fallen world. This world is not redeemed yet. It is still under futility because of sin. Romans 8. Read Romans 8. We are promised that there will be difficulties. There will be hardships. 
People want to quote First Peter five, be so uh, five eight, be sober and vigilant. For your enemy, the adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It might be good if we continue to read the rest of that passage. That might be helpful to see that in context, wouldn't it? Because Peter goes on to tell those who he's talking to in First Peter, after verse uh, eight, he tells them, resist him. Resist who? The devil. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I would like to ask Isaiah these questions to, to this rebuttal. Why didn't Paul tell Timothy to do self-deliverance? When he wrote to Timothy and told him to take a little wine for his stomach ailment, why didn't he just tell him, you need to cast a demon out of your stomach, Timothy? You have, a, you have an illness that's brought on by a demon. Why don't you cast that out? Why didn't Paul cast demons out of Trophimus in 2 Timothy 4.20 when he was ill? He left him in Miletus, sick. Why didn't Paul cast demons out of him? Why didn't Epaphroditus was sick in Philippians 2 to the point of death? Why didn't Paul cast a demon out of him? Why didn't Paul cast the do self-deliverance on himself in 2 Corinthians 12 when there was actually a spirit, a messenger of Satan sent by God to keep him from becoming conceited because of the revelations given to him? And some people debate it was a physical illness. Some people believe that um, Paul had malaria, that he had vision troubles. It does look like in some of the scriptures when you read that there, it does point such in, in the book of Galatians that he had some vision trouble. That he had a vision ailment that he dealt with, whether it was from his physical stonings or that he endured or th from the physical ailments, even maybe malarial based. Who knows? There are some people that believe the messenger of Satan was a physical person to harass him during his ministry. Paul pleaded with the Lord three times to remove that thorn in the flesh. And what was Jesus' response? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There was no self-deliverance. There was no casting out demons or anything like that. God used that for his glory to humble Paul, to bring Paul low, and to keep him in a place where he would glorify Christ instead of himself. But you won't hear this teaching. I'm sorry, you won't hear this teaching in these deliverance ministries. But you need to hear it because we need to get back to Scripture. And you don't need to hear people tell you, well, you're not going to find this stuff in Scripture. So you just need to take my questions and use them to basically like... Put ammo in your gun and to, to um, spiritual gun, so to speak. And so you can fire these at the hypercritics and the, the cessationists or whoever is questioning you and doesn't believe or the Pharisees or whatever. You need to get back to scripture is what you need to do. Um, and that's what we're doing today. Number six, if Christians can't have demons, what is the point of casting out demons? Wouldn't you just get people saved and the demons automatically leave? Again, I'm going to be frank. Spiritual warfare and supernatural material is a lucrative business. It is. And it's something that people flock to and they want to uh, read more and more about it. They want to have it done to them. They want supernatural experiences. They want to feel powerful. And so talking about these types of things, it automatically bumps up the clicks and it bumps up the shares and it automatically gets people's attention. But again, I go back to the whole premise that, that is set here. Where does it say Christians can have indwelling demons? The, the burden of proof is actually on you, Isaiah, and others to show that through Scripture, Christians can have indwelling demons. And the fact that the statement was made in the beginning that these are not based in Scripture, that these questions are not based in Scripture, and lends to experience, that sets up the premise that Scripture is not sufficient in understanding true deliverance that can only come through Jesus Christ. Because when you are arguing, again, from experience or your own authority or from someone else's book that they've written based on their authority, but you can't go back and rest on the authority found in the Word of God, the written Word of God, then you are basically saying that Scripture is not sufficient enough for us to understand the, the quote, hidden deeper things or the mysteries of God or that we can't understand true freedom in Christ. Well, Scripture is sufficient for that. And so I would say for number six, Christians can't have demons. And I would also say that Scripture instructs us to resist the devil, to be sober and vigilant, to pray, and to trust in the Lord. 
And we can also you know, rest in the fact that Colossians 2, 13 through 15 tells us this. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He's already, he's already conquered the devil. He's defeated the devil. And now that we as believers, who are in, those who are in Christ, have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we don't have to be afraid of demons being in our bloodlines. We don't have to. Galatians 3.13, if anything, this will, this will comfort and bring you some, some much needed deliverance as far as some freedom in the truth of the word. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. There are no generational curses. I'm sorry, as far as you, if you want to think that they're in a spiritual aspect of demonic entities. Yes, we still live in a fallen world and we're going to have some things because of the curse that came that we are going to have to continue. And we all die. That's part of the curse, too. You're going to try to take that away or are you going to rebuke the spirit of death? Are you going to say that that's a demon? The demon is a spirit of death. You can't get rid of death at this point until Christ returns and the last enemy to put be put under his feet is death. So, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that we can look at here and we can say, this doesn't bring true freedom when you tell Christians this. And I'm also going to say this, just because I say this or someone else says that, uh, that Christians cannot have indwelling demons, that does not automatically make the false dichotomy that we automatically believe there are no demons. That's not true. I believe that there are demons. I believe there are angels. Scripture speaks of those. I simply choose to believe what Scripture says and that there is more power and freedom in what Christ said and the truth of the Word of God. And I choose to believe that the Holy Spirit is strong enough not only to save me but to deliver me. I believe that. And you can call that foolish all you want to and you can call it naive and you can call it... Uh, you know, not being truly free and that, and saying that I need deliverance. No, I actually had deliverance. I got out of this type of mindset and out of this type of belief system. And that has been the tremendous deliverance on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, my salvation, but also coming out of deceptive teachings that only brought more bondage has been truly freeing. Number seven, why did Philip cast out demons in Acts 8 after they heeded his message? Shouldn't he just have led everyone to Christ and their demons would automatically leave? What does Acts 8 say about Philip? What was his message? It says in verse five that he proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord in verse 6 paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Now, there's a lot to unpack in, in that understanding in chapter 8 with the fact that the gospel was coming to the Samaritans, which the Samaritans were part Jew and part Gentile. And that the Holy Spirit, the apostles actually came and brought the, the Holy Spirit to them. That was another miraculous thing to show that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was coming on the Samaritans. And if you know anything um, a little bit about the Bible, you'll know that Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. So we see here of what's going on, but it doesn't say again that these people were believers that he cast demons out of. See, there's an assumption being made there. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say they were, and it doesn't say they weren't. So we don't know <laughs> if they were believers or not. But we don't see anything that, that gives us the indication that he was casting demons out of believers. Number eight, do you know any legitimate deliverance ministers that actually believe Christians can't have demons? I guess my response would be, I don't know any legitimate deliverance ministers. Because again, the whole issue with deliverance ministry is that you are doing it to believers in Christ. Are you all taking time when people say they come to you with demons? Are you taking time to share the gospel with them first and foremost? Or is your understanding of the gospel to do miracles, signs, and wonders? And I would like to know if you could give me an understanding of the gospel in accordance with scripture and not in accordance with your experience. So my answer would be, no, I actually don't know any legitimate deliverance ministers. 
Because deliverance, if you look at it biblically based, for example, even in Luke 4, 18, when you even look at that word deliverance there that's used, it pertains to forgiveness and remission of sin. And this required Christ's sacrifice as punishment of sin and sin is put away and the sin is sinner and the sinner is delivered from the power of sin. People hear deliverance in these movements and they immediately think demons. But do you know that you've been saved? If you're a true believer, that you've been saved from the wrath of God, according to Romans 5, 8, 9, 10, when you read in Romans 5, that you see that Jesus Christ has saved us from the wrath of God. He's delivered us from the wrath of God. Colossians 1, 13 is a wonderful passage. This is one I've read many times, especially when I've been looking at pigs in the parlor and I've shared this numerous times with people during this. Um, Colossians 1.13 tells us that Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we've been delivered out of the domain of darkness. We've been brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light, according to 1 Peter 2. This whole thing of saying that Christians can have indwelling demons, this is what brings contention. And rather that the answer is, well, you have demons. And when you talk to a lot of these people, you'll find everything is a demon. Almost virtually everything is a demon. Rarely will you hear the talk of sin. Now, Isaiah does talk about sin from time to time. But you will hear much more emphasis on the demonic and what it's doing is it's negating personal accountability for sin. And a lot of these people, I would dare say, if you started questioning them and counseling them biblically, you would find that they lack biblical literacy and they lack biblical discipleship. That's what it comes down to. Um, and being willing to submit oneself to the word of God as an authority. And, and uh, ultimately to submit to Christ as your Lord and Savior and to submit the word of God as an authority in your life, that it's sufficient to instruct you and that the Holy Spirit is more than efficient as the third person of the Trinity to equip you and to, um, to lead you into all truth. Number nine, can you show one verse in all of the Bible that says a Christian can't have a demon without using 2 Corinthians 6.15, which is about partnering with unbelievers, and 1 Corinthians 6.19 is about sexual sin. Neither verse is about Christians having demons. No, it's not, but it's telling us that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so why can't we use 1 Corinthians 6.19? 1 Corinthians 6.19 is reminding believers that, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you were bought at a price and your body is to glorify God. Yes, the context is sexual immorality and sexual impurity, but the, it is also pointing to the fact of Paul reminding believers, by the way, and let me just say this, he's right. It doesn't say anything about Christians having demons there. That would be a great thing to actually take note of. Why didn't Paul tell the Christians there, you're dealing with sexual, uh, instead of sexual sin, well, you've let sin in, so you need to cast out the sexual demons that you all are dealing with. Well, why doesn't it say that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19? Rather, Paul is making the point that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And actually, to reverse it, we actually don't have any scriptures that show that Christians can have demons. We do see, though, where Christians are over and over in the epistles are instructed not to cast demons out of themselves or do self-deliverance or to seek a deliverance minister, but they are to seek Christ, to focus on Christ, to trust in Christ. They are admonished over and over again to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit and to rely on the Holy Spirit and to go back to the Word of God for proper biblical understanding. It's ironic to me sitting here and talking about this as I used to be on the other side of the fence here and thinking about some of these things now. And I think, why are people fighting so hard to tell believers that they have demons? Why are these ministers treating believers as unbelievers? That, that's, some, that's something that I think on quite often is why are people that are professing believers being treated like unbelievers? There's just no freedom in telling Christians they have indwelling demons. What is the point of salvation then? And why would you tell someone that, or to tell them to pray, um, that, that God would give you all the power you need so that no demon could ever come back again? What low view of the Holy Spirit do you have that you would pray such a prayer and to think that, that the Holy Spirit would cohabit with a demon? Number 10, Paul says, if you have anger, you give place to the devil. That's in Ephesians 4, 27. Where does the devil go if you give him a place? Well, does that say that he comes to indwell you? 
And another question is when if you're giving a foothold to Satan or giving a place to Satan, is Satan omnipresent? He's not omnipresent. He's not like God. He's not the antithesis of God. One thing to consider here is that the devil is the little G, the little God of this world. And we see in the, even in the Gospels when uh, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and they don't believe who he is, the Jewish people that don't believe who he is, he c tells them that they are of his father, they are of his, their father, the devil, that he's the father of lies. And he's been a, a liar from the a murderer from the very beginning. And, and scripture and scripture also tells us that when we are apart from Christ, when we're not saved, we're not born again, that we are children of disobedience, that we're children of wrath, that we are uh, that we are agreeing with with the influence in of Satan, essentially, that we are agreeing with him because he rebelled against God. He sinned against God and Adam and Eve followed suit. They listened to the serpent. Eve listened to the serpent instead of listening to Adam. And isn't it ironic, too, when you think about even in Genesis, when God comes and he says to them, what have you done? And he says to Eve, what have you done when she ate the fruit? And she says, what's the first thing she says? She doesn't take responsibility. She blames the devil. <laughs> Just like in the deliverance ministries, it's always, well, the devil made me do it. The serpent deceived me. Again, please go back to scripture. When Paul, when he asked this question about not giving, that if you have anger, you give place to the devil. We know that anger is a, Galatians 5 talks about fits of anger are works of the flesh. And that those who operate in these things will not inherit the, the kingdom of God. What is the answer for those of us who are in Christ? It doesn't mean that we have to continue to go to get deliverance from a demon. We have a high priest who is ever interceding for us. Hebrews tells us this. We need Christ interceding for us. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. We are told every day, the Lord's Prayer even tells us that we, that we are repenting every day. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Thank God for the Holy Spirit who truly abides, who abides in true believers because he will convict us and he will bring us to repentance in that and further pr uh, propel us to turn to Christ in the midst of our weakness and ask him to strengthen us and to forgive us and to continue to renew our minds with the word of God, that his word will be written on our hearts and that we would continue in that fellowship with him and be truly changed. And that change can only come through, through Christ. Number 11, if Christians can't have demons, how did Satan fill Ananias's heart in Acts 5 after being filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 4? Well, we don't see that he was actually filled in Acts 4. There are some debates that some people will say, well, Ananias was a believer. Ananias and Sapphira were believers or they weren't believers. But regardless, they lied to the Holy Spirit, who's the third person of the Trinity. And also to say that he filled Ananias's heart could simply mean that Ananias was being influenced, outwardly influenced, and that his sinful desires were being fed by that, that it was an agreement with how Satan would be. It doesn't say anywhere that he indwelled Ananias. It might also be sobering to go back and read Acts 5 and to see what happened to Ananias and Sapphira under the new covenant before the Holy Spirit and to wonder, were they believers? Were they not believers? Because there's a but at the beginning of, of Acts 5 as well. So we have to wonder, were these people truly believers? Were they not believers? But it doesn't say anywhere that they were, that they were filled with Satan. And it doesn't say Sapphira was. Uh, Peter only says this to uh, Ananias. So, and they were both killed because of what they did. Number 12, Satan entered Judas. He was an apostle, but not a Christian. Yep. <laughs> uh, there's nowhere in scripture that says that Judas was a believer. Judas was selected by Christ himself as an apostle to fulfill scripture, to fulfill prophecy for his betrayal. Judas was selected by Jesus Christ himself to fulfill this. So for example, when you read in John 6 and beginning in uh, verse 60, after he talks about the eternal life and eating his flesh and drinking his blood and, um, what, what that meant and many people getting very offended by what he said. Even the disciples said it was a hard saying and asked who could listen to it. And Jesus uh, knew that they were grumbling and he said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. 
And in parentheses, it says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And then he goes on to say in verse 70, after they're talking to him, he says, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. In Acts 1, we see that Peter talks about when they're casting lots to replace Judas. We see that he mentions about Judas going to his own place. So, no, Judas was not a believer. There's nothing in Scripture that, that would even remotely point to the fact that Judas was a believer in Christ. He was chosen to fulfill the prophecy of Scripture for Jesus to be betrayed. And Jesus knew this because he's the son of God. Number 13, do you have one Bible instance where demons left when someone got saved? This is another rewording, another redundancy. You're assuming, again, you're assuming that every single person has a demon. And you're also assuming that believers still have demons indwelling them. There's nothing in scripture that, that indicates that. Number 14, do you have any scripture to show deliverance is not for born again believers? Honestly, I think that's a rewording to a certain point of number 13 and maybe one or two others before. But deliverance, again, when you look at that word, it can have uh, one or two different meanings. The main meaning of it is the forgiveness of sins to be saved, to be rescued from from something. I mean, you see this in the Old Testament. The deliverance was was given to people, God's people at different times. They were, were delivered from calamity. They were, they were rescued from from danger. That's a type of shadow of being delivered from sin. Um, when they were delivered, the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt. Egypt could easily be a type and shadow of the worldly way of the sin. And the Israelites, God's people were delivered out of that. He rescued them. And so when we hear this word deliverance, it's not, it's not isolated to automatic. Well, it's just from demons. You're actually, again, you are delivered from the wrath of God. You are delivered from God himself, if you want to think of it that way, before you come to Christ, when you come to Christ, when you come to Christ, you are saved from the wrath of God. You're delivered from it because of Christ's atonement on the cross. You're delivered from the penalty of sin. In this world, you are delivered from the power of sin by the Holy Spirit. And someday you are going to be saved slash delivered from the presence of sin, which is when you'll be glorified. This is all good news. But sadly, the deliverance ministry in this, telling Christians that they have demons, that's not good news. Number 15, if deliverance isn't for believers, wouldn't the demons come back seven times worse? He is referencing here Matthew 12, 43 through 45. First of all, when Jesus is making it clear that he's the strong man, as you read earlier on, Jesus is the strong man that binds Satan and that he has power over Satan. He goes on in this passage in 43 to say, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. He's speaking to the Pharisees there, and this was also during the time when Jesus had yet to, to die, to be resurrected, and to send the Comforter, to send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to indwell believers in Christ. If deliverance isn't for believers, wouldn't the demons come back seven times worse? No, because believers aren't empty. If you don't cast demons out of believers, who do you do deliverance on? Well, again, deliverance is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And deliverance comes from being saved, saved from the penalty of sin. So actually we minister deliverance to unbelievers. And even as believers in Christ, we continue to still need to hear the gospel, to be reminded from what we have been saved, and to be reminded that we do have hope, and we have joy in this world, and we have a future to look forward to, and that we have trust in Christ. And even in these light momentary afflictions that we face, we have an eternal weight of glory that has been prepared for us. That's in Corinthians. This focus on that believers have demons. Would you rather go to scripture and be encouraged as a believer in Christ to know, okay, I'm to resist the devil and I can do this through prayer. I trust what Christ did on the cross. I trust that he has defeated the adversary. He's given me his word to understand that this is what I rest on as the truth and that 
I have not been left alone, that I have not been left ill-equipped. Would you rather do that or would you rather keep running to a deliverance minister that's going to keep telling you over and over again that you have demons? The question I would ask is, have these deliverance ministers gone and done some evaluation of repeat offenders, people that keep coming back for deliverance and saying they have demons or they keep hopping from one deliverance minister to another. That should be a huge red flag if someone keeps doing that, that something is wrong, first of all, that there's something wrong with that person's understanding of the gospel. They maybe have never heard the gospel. See, these are things they need to consider. And this goes on. People hop from deliverance minister to deliverance minister looking for freedom and instead they need biblical discipleship or maybe they need to hear the gospel first and foremost and to understand what it means to be saved and then understand sanctification and sit in a good solid bible teaching church that's going to equip them and help them to understand what it means to be a believer in christ and to be a fruitful believer in christ and that what true victory looks like and true victory doesn't look like that you have a life that that you never have problems and that you never struggle and that you're never faced with another temptation in your life ever again and true freedom doesn't mean that you're not going to have to resist the enemy in this world and that you're not going to um, have to battle with sin every day or that you're not going to have thoughts you shouldn't have or things, but that you can come to the throne of grace or that you can come before the Lord and that you can repent and that you can ask God to help you by the leading of his Holy Spirit and not be condemned. Those who are in Christ, Romans 8, therefore there is no, therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Huh, there's such good news in the gospel. If only we would trust the word of God. If only we would trust the word of God. Instead, we're going, and there's nothing wrong with reading other people's books. Just hear me on that. There's nothing wrong with reading good, solid, good books that people are gleaning from, and they're pointing you back to scripture and pointing you back to the truth of the word and giving you some nuggets to, to chew on or to digest from the word and, for, and to stir your hunger to be a student of the word. But there, it is very sad in this day and age when we are relying on prophetic words on online sites. We are relying on other people's books for revelation when we have, when what we need is proper illumination of the word of God. That is what is lacking. Everybody wants something new and something fresh and we want something exciting and something riveting and something that gives us a, a goosebump experience and gives us something that we can tangibly feel or taste or see or touch. Whereas we should be opening our Bibles every day and reading the word of God and feasting on the word of God and saying, God, your word is enough to equip me, to help me to understand, to walk and be trained in righteousness and to be re reproved and rebuked and corrected and instructed. And it's enough for me to to desire fellowship with you every day and that the Holy Spirit, I trust the Holy Spirit who dwells within me is going to illuminate the word to me to where I have understanding and I'm going to walk in your ways and I want to glorify you in all that I do. And even if that looks like a normal everyday life where I'm a mother that is glorifying you, I'm raising children that are godly and under the admonition of the Lord, I'm um, serving others. I'm testifying of you. And above all, I have true fellowship with you because I'm in your word and I'm doing what you're saying to do, not because I feel like I have to or out of obligation. It's because I desire to as your child and as your servant. Instead, what you will find is that it will just be a perpetual hamster wheel doing this and you'll never feel free. If you are seeking deliverance ministry in this, you will never fully feel free. There will always be that nagging thought in the back of your mind going, well, what if I do this? I'm having this problem. I, I need to go back and look at my bloodline to make sure that there, one of my ancestors didn't do something that let a demon in or I haven't done this or that. Go before the throne of grace. Rest, read the Bible and rest in God. Rest, rest in God. It doesn't mean be lazy. It means rest and trust in him. Be content with what Christ has done. Be content and rest in that. Glean from his word and understand it every day and, and trust in it. Trust in his word because it's true. Number 17, why do you think it's okay to pick and choose which of Jesus's commands we obey? Again, that's a redundant question. He asked that early on. I believe that was in numbers two and three. Number 18, why don't you accept the testimony of Christians who say they were delivered after they were saved? Now, I this is going to be a really touchy one. And and this, I mean, no disrespect in saying this at all. I, I do not. The question could easily be asked, why don't you accept the testimony of Roman Catholics when they say that They've had these supernatural experiences. 
Um, why don't you accept the testimony of Mormons when, when they say that they've had prophecies and they've had supernatural experiences and they speak in tongues? Why don't you accept the testimony of witches and warlocks when they say that they've tackled demons? Why don't you accept the 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 claims of other religions that cast out demons? Hindus do. Shamans do. Uh, they do in Taoism, uh, Native Americans, African witch doctors, Judaism, Islam. A lot of these religions have testified the personal experiences of casting out demons and doing exorcisms. Do you accept their testimony to say they were delivered after they, um, after they had an exorcism done? And that may not seem like an equal question, but I believe it is. Because if you're going to say that we had to accept the testimony of hundreds of thousands or millions of people and they're saying these things, but we're not allowed to test it, then again, that's not biblical. Did Jesus tell us that we're to test? To know people by their fruit, we can't just, we have to inspect fruit and test it, right? So if you want us to obey, like what you said in a couple different questions about, do you think it's okay to pick and choose which of Jesus' commands we obey? I believe it's biblical to obey the instruction to test everything, to uh, examine fruit, to, to test fruit, to see where it comes from, to inspect it, to evaluate and make sure that something is lining up with the word of God. And so I don't accept everybody's testimony. And case in point, I don't accept my own when I was in this movement of hearing the voice of God for myself, of thinking I was getting extra biblical revelation, of thinking I was having all these supernatural encounters that I couldn't verify or validate, and then trying to say that God told me this, God told me that, the Lord said this, the Lord said that, taking the Lord's name in vain and saying those things, and also um, not having the proper reverence for the name of God when, when saying these things. I've had to reject a, a good amount of things that I came out of because they didn't line up with scripture. And I either had to choose my experience or I had to choose what scripture had to say about it. And I chose scripture. That experience was real and I felt something or it actually did happen. That doesn't mean anything. So no, I don't accept the testimony of people that said they were delivered after they were saved. I don't know because you, we have to look at the fruit of people's lives. And we need to make sure, and we are to see if it lines up with, in accordance with the word of God. Number 19, can you give one verse showing how deliverance changes after Pentecost? Well, deliverance isn't mentioned much even after, as far as demons coming out of people, it's not mentioned a whole lot. And even still, that was not a huge emphasis on, on Christ's ministry. We know that he was able to cast demons out and he gave the authority over to his apostles to do that because it validated and authenticated their ministry as his followers, as his believers, as his disciples. Can you, Isaiah, or anyone give one verse that shows after Pentecost that, that Christians were instructed to cast demons out of themselves or cast demons out of other believers? Number 20, when did the demons from your unsaved life ever come out? Again, this is assuming everybody has demons. I'm sorry to reiterate this, but again, redundancy in questions. When did the um, demons from your life come out, Isaiah? <laughs> I mean, we could, we could turn this question around and ask other people this. How do we know that these deliverance ministers don't have demons? Who's done deliverance on them? How often are they getting deliverance? Are they making sure that they're not letting demons in on a daily basis? This is, again, making the assumption that everybody has demons. Number 21, can you show in the Greek language the difference between oppressed and possessed? Nope, because I'm not a Greek scholar, and I'm not really sure how that's relevant to this discussion, because you automatically believe uh, that, that Christians can be in, that physically indwelt by demons. Now, you could make the distinction of saying that as far as if you want to go a little bit further in possession, technically Satan doesn't own anything. Um, God does. So, I mean, we can go there, but I'm not a Greek scholar, so I can't broach number 21. Sorry. Number 22, can you show one place a demon was only on someone and not in someone? Did Jesus ever cast demons off of people? I know that there's some people that um, make that distinction that they'll say that a demon can be attached to someone on the outside and some people haven't take issue with this because they believe well if you say well you can be outwardly influenced you could certainly be outwardly tempted to sin and to do things that you shouldn't but he doesn't believe that and those that hold to this don't believe that they believe this is kind of like a, a gotcha 
question, I, I think, because their belief is, well, the Bible doesn't say that, that, that people were indwelt with demons or they were demonized. So we know that believers, we are in this world, but we're not of this world. And we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us who abides not only with us, but in us. We see here that when people hold to this position, again, Christians can have indwelling demons. They can't be on them and uh, they have to be in them and uh, trying to get you in a have a little gotcha moment in number 22. No, I don't know of a place where it says that they're only on someone and not in someone. But that, again, goes to your belief that that believers can have indwelling demons. And there are those of us that no longer believe that or have never believed that uh, for those that hold that position that have never believed that. I no longer believe that that Christians can have indwelling demons, but I do believe that there are because we live in this world and the God of the little G, the God of this world can certainly influence people. He can tempt to do things and to try to deceive. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us that will help us. I'm sorry if I'm not answering that question very well, and it's quite possible at times that I'm not answering them as most people would like, um, so forgive me for that. Number 23, can you show one place in scripture that casting out demons was only for the apostles? Well, we do see some such as Philip, as was mentioned in Acts 8 earlier in one of the questions that he was casting out demons, but he was also under the authority of the apostles. So when you do see this take place, you see this happening with those that were under the authority of the apostles. Now, we do see um, also in the gospel, and it escapes my memory right now, but there was also someone who was casting out demons and the disciples were upset and they pointed it out to Jesus. So he was, this person was not one of the disciples. So we do see that, but we also see that, um, again, in, in Matthew seven, we see that there are people that were not apostles that were claiming to cast out demons and they did not know the Lord. Um, so we do see some examples of that. His question was, can you show one place in scripture that casting out demons was only for the apostles? When it was truly done, it was under the apostolic authority, which came back through Jesus Christ, who is the chief apostle. Um, Mark 16, number 24, Mark 16 says, all who believe will cast out demons. Does that verse no longer apply to us? And if so, where does the Bible say that no longer applies? Well, Mark 16, 15 through 18, actually Mark 16, 9 through 20 is called what, what is known as a textual variance. That is one of the scriptures. Um, in addition, for example, in John 8 with the the account of the woman caught in adultery. That is another textual variance. And there's another one in first John, if I'm not mistaken, there's a couple of different textual variances, meaning these particular passages are not found in the oldest manuscripts that are found in, in the Greek for the new Testament. And so when they're not in the oldest manuscripts, they will put these in brackets, depending on the um, translation that you're reading and they'll make note of it. And so there are some scholars who will argue from this point and they will say, well, these are not in the oldest manuscripts. And so we really can't say for certain if, for example, Mark really wrote this in Mark 16 or if someone else added this. Now, I want to throw this out here again, just for consideration and food for thought. When I was reading Mark 16, and if I'm misreading it, someone can please feel free to um, bring some correction my way. Mark 16, when I when you read it in context, beginning at verse 14. Uh, with, this is the Great Commission here. And it says, Afterward, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Now, what did he just do in verse 14? He rebuked them for their unbelief. So who's the audience here? It's the 11 disciples. Now, when I read this in context, now it makes perfect sense to me, I think, because I always heard it was Mark 16, 15 through 18. Those were the verses that were quoted to us for years. But if you take time to read verse 14, it, it begins to become clear who he's talking to. These signs will follow those who believe. Well, he just got done rebuking his disciples for unbelief. So it seems as if 
that he's talking to the disciples and these signs will accompany those who will believe, who will come out of their unbelief. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So there's not a, well, they might, they, they may have a partial deliverance. They may, they, it's, it's a progressive deliverance. We don't see that anywhere. Where's the, where does the Bible say that there's progressive deliverance? For those like Isaiah and others that teach that, that you may have to have more than one deliverance session. Where is that taught in scripture? Uh, I've heard other people mention this too, so this is not my own thought or question. But another thing to consider is, okay, well, if it says to believe to cast out demons, and if that no longer applies to us, are you taking up serpents? Are you drinking deadly poison? Because some people will take the first part of Mark uh, 16, 17, and they'll say that's literal, but then verse 18, they'll say that's allegorical or um, that's that's a metaphorical. We're not really supposed to take up serpents or drink poisons. Well, then we're not really supposed to uh, cast out demons either or speak in new tongues. And by the way, they did speak in new tongues. It's called Acts 2 in Pentecost. <laughs> So again, you can, when you look at this in context, it makes perfect sense. And just because, by the way, let me say this too, for those that may say, well, then you don't believe that the scripture's uh, true. No, the textual variance does not change the gospel. So the textual variances that are noted in scripture that are not in older manuscripts, if you don't see this in the older manuscripts, it doesn't change. That doesn't mean it changes the authenticity um, of the scripture, the, the the inerrancy of the scripture, and it doesn't change the gospel. So these textual variances don't affect the the gospel. They don't affect the fundamental belief and the fundamental teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lastly, the only method in scripture of getting demons out of people was casting them out. If we are not supposed to do that today, what is the method according to scripture to get demons out of people? The gospel is the answer. The gospel is the answer. Even if you were dealing with someone that you believed was demon possessed, um, the gospel is the answer. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that there are, you know, when you get into third world countries and I've been to those that... Um, there are some people that are stories, and again, these are anecdotal, so we don't know. These are secondhand accounts, so we don't know because it can't be verified, of missionaries being put in positions where they had to cast demons out of people or uh, alleged supernatural things that happen. We know that God can do supernatural things, and he, he can do whatever he wants in the confines of his own word that he has established. God can do whatever he wants. But the thing is, is that that's not normative. And so what we've done is we've made the we've done we've made things like this normative and then we've taken other people's extra biblical revelation and we've made it the truth for people to stand upon. So my answer to him to getting demons out of people is the gospel. The the deliverance that's a children's bread is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. And I will stand on that and that's a hill I'll die on. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a few thoughts I want to give you to also to consider here. R.C. Sproul had this quote I came across. If a person indwelled by the Holy Spirit can at the same time be sovereignly controlled by an evil spirit, then our redemption is meaningless. And I agree with that statement. Because the thing that I find now when I look at deliverance ministry, the issue with this teaching is a dependency upon the deliverance minister rather than upon Christ. And I go back to the question, how many re repeat offenders are there in, in these types of ministries? How many people are going up to be delivered? How many people are getting on these Zoom calls? How many people are getting on these webinars or on the Facebook Lives and they're thinking that they need deliverance done when maybe they have never even heard the gospel to begin with? They prayed a prayer, they walked down an aisle and they thought it was a done deal, said and done. And there is no sinner's prayer, by the way. And they think that that's it. And they don't go to church, maybe. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe they go to a church that doesn't teach sound biblical doctrine. Maybe they have no understanding. They haven't been fully, uh, they haven't been properly discipled in scripture. Maybe they don't even take time to read the word of God or to listen to the word of God daily so that, that their minds can be renewed. There could be a lot of different factors in this, but the issue with this teaching that I find is so dangerous among other things, is that you are having a dependency upon a deliverance minister. I mean, where do you see in scripture that people um, schedule their deliverance session? Where is that? Because they will do Zoom calls and schedule Zoom calls to do deliverance on people. So 
deliverance is not that pressing that you need to do it immediately, that you want to schedule Zoom calls that you want to do mass deliverances on people? Where do we see that in scripture? That believers were gathered and that they did mass deliverance. Where do we see self-deliverance? That is, that is a reliance upon you as being your own savior and just using the name of Jesus. You see, I, I'm thankful when I think about the things that, that, I, that I came out of. I'm thankful when I face trials and even sin in my life. I do not run to a deliverance minister to talk to me like an unbeliever. And to keep me in further bondage. Now, I actually go to the deliverer, Jesus Christ. I approach the throne of grace. And I do what 1 John 1, 9 says to do. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm, I'm thankful as I continue to read in 1 John into chapter 2, when I understand that I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that he is the propitiation for my sins and not for mine only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, I know that I have come to know him if I keep his commandments. Those things are comforting to think about. I take great comfort in uh, in thinking on 1 John 5, 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. I take great comfort in those passages. I take great comfort in having proper biblical understanding that grows more and more every day and the correction that the word of God brings by the power of the Holy Spirit to know and understand his word better so that I may glorify Christ. And I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in fear of a demon in a bloodline or anything else like that because Christ is sufficient. He is sufficient. His work is sufficient. His Holy Spirit is greater than any demonic entity. And he is not going to cohabit with a demon. And so if you are one that has taken stock in the deliverance ministry, I urge you, go back to scripture. Make sure you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the place you need to start first and foremost. Make sure that you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, why he died on the cross. What has he saved you from? What does it mean to be born again? Repent and believe. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Your faith is by grace through Christ alone. You don't need to fear if you are a believer. You do not need to fear a demon residing in you. Be honest enough to ask yourself, who is your dependency on? Is it upon Christ or is your dependency upon getting to the next meeting that this deliverance minister has? So that you think that you can be free from the alleged demon that's in you, or if you really know Christ at all. And I know that that is a controversial thing to say, and it brings hostility and anger by some to say such a thing, to question somebody's salvation. But we need to test ourselves to see if we're even in the faith. And we need to, to test to see if we even know Christ. And I don't mean by an experiential thing. I mean, according to what the word of God says, the standard of what the word of God says, according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope that this has encouraged and helped you in some way. Second Corinthians 317 says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And my friend, if the Holy Spirit is residing in you, then there's no bondage within you that he can't overcome. And you don't need deliverance ministry for that. You don't need a devil cast out of you where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. Ponder on that and get back to the Word of God. Be blessed today by the truth of God's Word. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at Lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to Lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.